We good? Yes. <coughs> if you want to, if you walk out, you don't. You're not walking in. <laughs> Told him. All right. So uh, I'm gonna try to speak slowly, even though I I speak usually very very fast, and uh, my accent is really hard to understand. But I'm going to try to tame it down and make it slow and nice. I, I have no idea if this talk is going to take an hour or 30 minutes or 45 minutes. I guess we'll see what happens, yeah? So what I like to do when I give talks is I, I don't like to brag about myself and say what I've done, but I like to know what people in the room actually have been doing. So uh, I can change. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I love you people, this is great. <laughs> so what I like to do is actually find out, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> so for those of you who are not late at all, that's right, what we're doing is, Jesus, there you go. All right. <laughs> Welcome in. Well, I guess we can stop this. We're gonna be there. We're gonna be doing this for like 40 minutes. <laughs> um, so yeah, as I said, what I like to do is actually see what you guys have been doing. So one of the questions I start with is, who uses PHP 5.3 here? Nice. On a daily basis or just for fun? <laughs> you you can put your hand down. <laughs> um, who writes any other languages than PHP? It's not bad. What kind of languages? Python. Python? Oh yeah, obviously we yeah. are. C sharp. Yeah. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's not true. Uh, I actually have the end of the, the the talk there is about bitching, so you'll see what I mean. So let's get going. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the landscape of PHP, how how PHP has been changing over the years, and what we've been trying to achieve or to what we're trying to become. Um, obviously, PHP has had a huge adoption, thanks to amazing, horrendous code bases such as WordPress, Joomla, and Drupal. Even though the code actually sucked pretty bad, they they helped a lot with the adoption of PHP everywhere in the world. And even today, we are still at a we're still a huge amount of websites, larger than any other language is probably ever going to be. Is projects. Can you still hear me? No? <laughs> so, yeah, as I said, from the museum, if you go to museum.php.net, you can see all the older versions of PHP. <coughs> and one thing, as I said, WordPress, all those projects started with very early versions of PHP. And the quality of the actual code, as I said, is, is pretty horrendous. But as we changed, we looked at other languages, we looked at features that we wanted, and you know, we, PHP kind of evolved, and there's this great character. Go on, go now. <laughs> there's, there's this great character that once said, the key to succeed is to adapt. And if you don't adapt, you can't succeed. And I think that's what PHP is doing very well. I mean, we, we've been building pretty much amazing features as such as amazing namespaces. I mean, I mean, sorry, I mean namespaces. <laughs> and no one likes that operator, the backslash operator. But it's fine. And who, who, who uses namespaces? <laughs> See, that's what I love. Everyone uses 5.3, but no one uses the actual features. So namespaces are not very complex. Uh, for those who use other languages, you've probably seen them before. The only thing namespaces bring to PHP is an extra organizational layer on top of PHP. It's easier to make libraries more object-oriented. It will not make your class names shorter. It will probably make them longer, but that's fine. And yes, we all hate that operator. So for example, in Python, there are packages and modules, sorry. In Java, there are packages. It's something very similar as well. And that is great to see PHP finally ad uh, adapting and changing to what other languages, other technologies, and just what other people want, wanted to see in PHP. One of the other really 
really cool features I love at PHP, or two of them, is closures and lambdas. For those who read JavaScript, you probably know what closures and lambdas are. So let's, let's try to make the difference between the two of them. Uh, actually, who uses closures or lambdas? All right. So a closure is, is effectively an anonymous function that's passed to another function. Let's, let's try to put it in a simple way like this. It's, it's, it's self-contained within what it's going to be invoked, whereas a lambda is completely anonymous. It's effectively a function assigned to a variable or assigned to nothing. And for those who use JavaScript or any other language, uh, that's, that's one of the revolutionary features that PHP finally added. We've been wanting this for years. Uh, for instance, if you do an array key uh, or array map, you can pass a closure instead of calling another function that you have to redefine and re-include. You are supposed to get applaud. <laughs> That's right, sit. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're back at closures and lambdas. And namespaces and closures and lambdas, something that, that's been, every single PHP developer that used another language was like, I need this in PHP. I need 5.3 we have, which is pretty amazing. But that's not all, that's not all that is in PHP 5.3. Uh, for those who don't seem to be using all the features of 5.3, here's some. We have la uh, late static binding, which is uh, some people don't like, but some other people like. It, it's some people say it's a test. I'm not going <laughs> to get into this because I'm very opinionated. Um, SPL, who uses SPL by any chance? That's very good. So SPL is a bunch of really amazing libraries, but one of the most important to me in SPL is not only the doubly linked lists and all the crazy stuff, it's the exceptions. Uh, not unlike Java, you can now, if you use SPL, you can throw logic, exception, uh, logic exceptions, you can throw uh, parameters exceptions, you can throw a uh, method out of bound exception and stuff like this. It makes it very easy for developers <coughs> to actually write code that is self-documented when you're developing and debugging it. Far, who, who has heard of Far before? All right, let's see, who's heard of uh, Java jars? pretty much the equivalent in the PHP world to Java jars. It's, it's a package. All gzip or, or all bzip2 or all whatever in, uh, compressing algorithm you want to use. And that's really cool because now you can include a FAR file which is your own framework and run it directly from there. You can run websites <laughs> directly from FAR files and this makes it very, very easy to deploy. And uh, that's pretty cool. You garbage selector in 5.3, much more effective. Uh, functors, we have short ternaries, so you don't need to do a variable, question mark, if, then, other thing, you just do question mark, colon, toop, and it does all the verifications itself, it's pretty cool. And then dynamic statics, which are the last ones at the bottom, not very pretty, but they work. Is that it to PHP 5.3? No, there's even more than this. So there's FPM. Uh, for those who know FPM, it's, it's effectively fast CGI process management. And it is absolutely my favorite feature of PHP 5.3. And that's the reason, uh, well, I'll get back to the after, but uh, FPM allows you to run pretty much a fast CGI module through Nginx. And finally, it's a module that's effective. You can run it through Apache as well. But uh, Apache is uh, something else. We'll, we'll get back to Apache. Uh, another thing that's really cool is MySQL native driver in PHP 5.3. You don't need external libraries anymore. You have the, the driver bundled in PHP, and it gives you access to uh, statistics and faster connections. Uh, I'm sorry, faster queries. You can read really what's happening, and you don't need uh, the external libraries of MySQL for anyone who tried to install or compile PHP at one point in their life with MySQL. They probably ran into this lib MySQL 1.a.so.l.d. And then you were like, what is this? Why is it happening? Now it's fixed. Um, daytime, for those who were watching uh, Derek earlier, daytime in PHP is the most useful feature if you use any other language and you've ever, ever tried to use daytime in another language. Python daytime is very fun, but the stuff Derek did, so sexy. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not joking, it's actually sexy. And then it's useful as well. Uh, there's another thing called Collator, which is an extension in, uh, in Peckle for 5.3 which allows you to, to, to play with strings, change the dates, change the strings, all this localization and internationalization stuff, which I think there's a talk after this afternoon from someone about this. I'm, I'm trying not to you know, step on any feet here. 
and obviously SQL 3 which is now a, a complete object-oriented interface to SQL 8, which is pretty cool. So do you get it? Do you see where I'm going? There's a lot of stuff in PHP 5.3 that you, you need to, to start playing with, that you need to, to look at to gain a new and a fresh perspective on how you can actually write code. I mean, yes, we all use 5.3 because it's very much faster than 5.2, but do you see all the stuff you can do now? I mean, that's the job. So uh, let's take a break. And can you imagine, that's me speaking slow. <laughs> Five point four. Let's see the two hands that will get up. Who have you who has used PHP five point four? Not you again. <laughs> What's your name? What's your name? Adam. Adam? Yeah, nice. <laughs> so uh, apart from all the stuff in PHP five point three, PHP five point four is pretty much ready to go out the door, just a few things to iron out. <laughs> For instance, do you remember this good old array definition? Nice, isn't it? You have an extra five characters for array. Well, now you have short array syntax. <laughs> I know, right? I know. You saved five characters. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Any better than that? <laughs> Do this again, yeah? <laughs> Short syntaxes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Alright, now that's out of the way, we know we have <laughs> let's get over this. Because it's also amazing. We know that now. But another thing that's really cool in 5.4 is you know when you write JavaScript and you write a function and you want the array key from that function and you don't want to assign it to a variable right away and Use it. But that's what you can do in, in 5.4 as well. There's array dereferencing as well. Oh. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> it's fairly sexy as well. I'm telling you, PHP is becoming some beast. <laughs> Are we good? Yeah? All right. So yeah, that, that's self-describing, really. There's not much that you can, that I, more than I can say about this. Uh, so then we go to traits. Ah, yeah. No one knows what they are, but that's fine. <laughs> yeah. So traits are very, yeah, they're very, um, very, I forget the word for it. That's how awesome they are. No. So traits are effectively a, a copy and paste at the engine level. So for those who have used languages that can do multiple inheritance, you might be familiar with the concept, but traits try to solve this because multiple inheritance is very funny. If you extend two classes, how do you know which, one is, which function is going to be used? If it, if it conflicts with another function, traits try to fix this. You can also change uh, the visibility of a function using traits. You can do a bunch of really cool stuff. Now, I have a little code example, which is huge. So obviously, it's a bit small. A bit small. Hold on. This is the code? <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's short syntaxes. <laughs> oh no, I'm trying to find which window. <coughs> Sorry, that's not PHP. I'm trying to find where I am. Yes. Where were we? Sorry. Oh, there you go. That's better. Is it? Can you read? Because that's a very complex code example. So we have a trait, all right? The trait is defined at the top. So it's a conference trait. <laughs> and uh, this trait pretty much defines a function that you want to reuse in all your other classes. And then we have the class Poland, which uses that trait, as you can see. Use conference trait. What does that do? At engine level, it copies the trait, it copies the functions, and then you can use it from your class uh, Poland. So new conf is new conf in Poland, and then you can use the get here method. Do you want to have a minute to chat, yeah? We're good. So uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what traits are. And then from uh, where you do your use, what you can do is uh, 
change the method public function get year to private function get year. So you could extend a class that uses Poland to have private classes. It's, it's really cool. You can do a lot of things with this. And for library developers, I mean, that, that's a great thing to do. Because you can now effectively reuse code and use many classes in your, in, in your libraries without impeding on your actual development and uh, how you are on your own workflow. So let's try to get back to that thing here. It's my big code example. <coughs> and I've lost track of time because I exited. So the other thing in, in 5.4 that I personally love a lot is uh, session handler. So who has ever written some sort of session handling class or function or you know all those session override <coughs> session uh, class uh, I, I forget the name of the functions, but you need pretty much seven function calls to override your functions, uh, your sessions in PHP. But now what you can do, we, if, you, if you write a session class or session storage, you can extend session handler, which means if you define a, a, a public function called write, you can seamlessly integrate rot 13 algorithm encryption or um, not encryption, what's the other word for the single way? You know, when you like a hash, hashing, yeah. like a single way hashing, you can do this with SHA, you can do all this stuff without having to define seven callbacks. And that's pretty cool. It makes it much easier uh, for developers to actually write better session handling functions. So there, there's, there's a lot more to PHP 5.4 than only traits and closure, uh, only traits and whatever it is, and arrays, because I think we'll go back to this now. <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> So there's a lot more. There, there are things in Ruby, for instance, uh, Fusion or Passenger, that we've always wanted in PHP. You know, we, we don't always want to define a new vhost in Apache. You're good. <laughs> we don't always want to define a new vhost in Apache, then modify our etc host file, and then create a new thing uh, to, to just test your, your app. It's really, really fucking annoying to do this. So there's this guy in Japan, a super amazing guy. Really funny guy. And he built a web server in PHP. What? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so from PHP, you can just run your web server and test your stuff. Actually, let's try it. Just for fun. So to run the, lo the web server, all you do is you define an index.php or index.html uh, or whatever. So let's, let's, let's do the index.php, let's do something funnier. run this. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to start the server. I can't see anything. <coughs> On port 8001. Ah, oh, my neck. <laughs> All right. Let's see if this exists anywhere. In theory. <coughs> what Apache Foundation thinks about it? Do you want me to be nice, no. honest, <laughs> or diplomatic? <laughs> they think it's amazing. Apache can finally run faster because no one uses it. <laughs> so, as you can see, it can serve requests pretty well, and you can see all the stuff coming in. But more importantly, check this out. I was trying it earlier, and it was too fast, and it was breaking Apache benchmark. Let's try to do this. Yeah, it's too fast. Hold on. We'll just use one user. The C is actually quite fucking stupid. Yeah, we'll find it eventually. Yeah, that one. 
Yeah, it's too fast. It's, it's approximately from my machine, which is pretty fast. It's, it's eight cores, eight gigs of memory, and SSD. I, I do pretty much 4,500 requests per second, which is pretty fast. And with Nginx, I do just about 3,000 requests per second. And with Apache, I do 24. <laughs> <laughs> 24 good ones, though. <laughs> no, it's not true. With Apache, it's actually fast as well. I just really hate Apache. So there is a built-in web server. And it's really amazing when you want to develop stuff because you don't need to, as I said, modify all your configurations, change this, change that. You just run it. And it is very easy. It, it accepts posts. It accepts gets, uh, it's sessions, and all this fancy, dodgy stuff. I don't know if it interacts well with APC. I think it does. It should. It's an SAPI anyways. But <coughs> when you think about all this stuff that's being added to PHP, it's fun. It's fun as a technology. It's fun as a language. But what does it mean for us, developers, engineers, front-end coders? Where, where are we going from there? We have a language now that implements very, you know, they're, they're very nice features. But will people use them? As you guys showed, well, as you guys showed me, you use 5.3, but you barely use any of those features. So there's a lot of education involved in this because it's a big mindset shift or a paradigm shift for most PHP developers to start using really good object-oriented architectures. But in general, that's what it means. It means stronger engineering. Uh, PHP is no longer used for hacking spider scripts. Who, who's ever written a spider script to parse a web page or... Actually, here's a funnier question. What's the ugliest PHP script you've ever written? <laughs> See, and the people laugh because every single person has written an ugly PHP script. <laughs> and I have as well. I mean, I don't even sleep at night. <laughs> so I just need one person. What's the ugliest thing you've ever written? Not all at the same time, please. <laughs> all right, uh, I'll give you one of mine. Um, I was giving a talk at JSCon two, three weeks ago. And uh, I wrote something, because I, I like languages. I'll get back to this. And I, I like learning a bunch of things. And I wrote this thing called NodePHP. And people are like, what the fuck? <laughs> and the idea is to use Node.js to interact with PHP directly through FPM, through fast CGI. I know, it makes no sense. So I wrote this really crazy thing where um, during the conference, I would run Wireshark to intercept all the traffic. Wireshark would write to a file. My PHP script would read that file. Through Node.js, I would ask people to go play a game online. I would identify their IP online from Node.js using WebSockets. And then this would create an Ajax call to the PHP, which would be served from Node.js, parsing the info from Wireshark, displaying the IP and the username, uh, the Twitter information for that user. <laughs> I know, huh? How nasty is this? <laughs> but the amount of crazy things I've, do I've seen and done, uh, cron jobs, there, there's a good one. I've written a cron job that waits on another cron job. <laughs> <laughs> that never ran. <laughs> this wasn't cool at all. So now it, it's not only about writing annoying scripts and annoying cron jobs. PHP really has the ability and the features to, to be a strong language, to be something that's on top of other languages again. But it's not only about the language. Features, features are very easy to do. And you know, the ecosystem of a language, what makes it strong is rarely the actual language itself. Uh, if you look at Ruby. Ruby, Ruby. <laughs> if you look at Ruby, for instance, Ruby is a very good language. But it doesn't really, well, it picks up for a s small group of people. But it never really picked up because the tools developed for it were not, were not uh, adequate like PHP was. For instance, I, I write a lot of Erlang. I love Erlang. No one uses Erlang. Because no one can read our land. And no one writes good tools. PHP, for instance, we've had, we've been building for 16 years tools from Pair. I'm the president of Pair, so I love Pair. <coughs> Even though it's kind of been dying, if you look at the new projects coming out, they use the new Pair stuff. But one of the big things in the PHP world, PHP unit. We took it from JUnit and made it even better. Sebastian has been doing some amazing work with PHP unit. Who's ever used PHP unit? Wow, that's sexy. 
<laughs> Who's ever used anything else for unit testing than PHP unit? What have you used? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, same for me. Um, there are a few other out there uh, for the PHP world. They're not as evolved as PHP unit or as commercialized as PHP unit. And I will probably advocate for PHP unit any day of the week, even though it's a bit bigger and a bit more bloated. It's still a very good project. It has documentation, a vibrant community, both in German and in, uh, in English, probably in Polish as well, I'd say, uh, considering the amount of people that raise their hands. And that's, that's the kind of tool that, that makes the PHP ecosystem much better. And then there's another one, Xdebug which you saw Derek talk about earlier. I will go as far as saying there's no other language that has something so well built for debugging. Xdebug is not only something you can run from the CLI or, or <coughs> parse the, 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 the dump file into kcashgrind or something. It's also integrated into IDEs now, so you can use Xdebug directly from there. If, if you've ever written any Visual Basic the debugging works fine. Uh, in Python as well, debugging, debugging is fine, but it's, it's not extensive. Well, it can be extensive, but it's not as extensive as Xdebug will make it. The reasons for that is because Derek is so involved <coughs> in the internals and in the Zen engine, or, uh, well, not the Zen engine, but everything that's internals PHP, that he can actually make something as amazing as Xdebug. That's another thing that makes PHP a very attractive language. He's saying no. Other things, just PHP packages. For instance, I, I, mentioned, I mentioned pair, pair which is, so just to make sure, who uses pair? Wow, that's very popular here. Who uses peco? Who knows the difference? <laughs> Two people. Good, good. I guess we'll get going with this. So pair and peco are two very similar projects. They're, well, in fact, the peco installer is the pair installer rebranded. The difference is Peckle, they're C extensions. Uh, they're PHP extensions written in C. And Pair, it's all PHP packages. So it, there's no C, and it can be run very dynamically without restarting the web server and all this stuff. So now that that's out of the way, um, Code Sniffer is one of the Pair packages. That is, <coughs> it, uh, well, it got me branded as a Nazi in my company. Because what we did is, not this one, the, the one before, is on every single commit that was made that was a PHP file, we would run the unit tests, we would run PHP code sniffer, and what code sniffer does is it verifies if your code adheres to some language, uh, to some structure. So say if you need four spaces or you need your curly brackets to be beside the function or under the functions, and every single commit that wouldn't adhere to the, the coding standards, it would get rejected. This was pretty cool. Code Sniffer made this. It's very easy. You can define your, your, your coding standards, your coding structures, and it can annoy a lot of people. <laughs> the thing is, I don't care annoying people for the sake of quality. If you run this for your open source project, then you know that every single contributor that's going to be interacting with the project is going to be forced to adhere to the coding standards. I know there are some very various views on coding standards, and some people say, let everyone use whatever they want. But I'm not one of those person. But yeah, make, make people comply. Follow the naming, uh, naming standards. Follow how the variables are named. It will pay in the long run. Uh, I don't remember what I was saying with this, getting work done. Oh yeah, obviously we have a lot of really cool tools in PHP, as I just said, I just mentioned a few of them. Another thing that makes PHP 5.2 and 5.3 very popular is that the, the rise of all the frameworks that are coming out there. I mean, a few months ago, I would have said that, <laughs> that's a joke for later, but that's fine. A few, a few months ago, I would have said, there's a PHP framework coming out every day, or every week. It was pretty, pretty much true, yeah? If you, if you Google for PHP frameworks, you get like 700 trillion re results. It's ridiculous. But a few of, few of them emerged. Uh, there's one I don't mention here, which is Yi. I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> I, I know there's someone giving a talk about Yi. Who is it? Is it here? How do you pronounce it? E. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and. Why I? Why I? <laughs> why? Why? So, E. Fuck, I can't say it. E is, is, is rising for some reason that I don't understand. 
Uh, and, but, <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's actually. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. It's actually super fast, and I've never used it, and I, I think it's been under commercialized. Uh, I don't know why Zen Framework has had such a big adoption. Well, I think I do know. It's because they put money behind the marketing of it and behind making it more popular. Uh, anyways, we'll get back to this. So one of the big frameworks out there right now is Symfony. And I don't speak PHP 5.2. I don't speak 5.2.x. And when I say Symfony, I don't mean Symfony 1. I mean Symfony 2. And there's one thing I like to say is, uh, Symfony people, they're dicks. <laughs> But by dicks, I mean dependency injection containers. Because <laughs> if there's one project that's doing a lot of good stuff for PHP, it's definitely Symfony. Uh, I mean, they, they're trying to pretty much annihilate Pear, which is cool. Because you know, when you have people kicking you and biting you up the hole, you have to react, you have to do things. As I said earlier, the key to success is the ability to adapt. And if you don't adapt, you die. And that's exactly what Symfony is doing. It's redefining the status quo. And it's bringing new, new concepts to the PHP world that, uh, that they've never been really used before. Dependency injection containers is one of them. It's been borrowed from, uh, from Java, a framework called Spring. I really hate dependency injection containers, how they're defined in Spring and in Symfony. I think it's extremely bloated and heavy. But the concept is good. It makes your code very easy to test. Uh, just to give you an idea, say you define a, 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 I'll use the Symfony example, you define a class user, a user class. You know, that's, that's very simple, we define the class. And then in the constructor, you want to use a uh, session storage. You know, some people would do, well, this, user, or this session equals new session storage. That means that your code is tightly bounded to, uh, your user class is tightly bounded to your session storage. Because it's, it's, it's hard coded and defined in there. Makes it really hard to test. Whereas with dependency injection, dependency injection, what you will do is in your constructor, you will pass a session object instead. And it makes it very easy later on to, to mock objects and, and test and make sure your unit tests are very independent and singular. I would say Symfony is probably one of the most innovative, innovative frameworks for PHP. I, I still think it's a bit bloated, but that's only my personal opinion. I wouldn't take it. I would say go and try Symfony. It's really cool. The other one is Zen Framework. If you need a job, you need to learn Zen Framework. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the, the most over-marketed framework that's out there, I think, in the PHP world. And it's a great framework. I mean, it's doing great stuff. For instance, the, the Zen Framework 2 that was released three, four days ago at ZenCon, the whole concept now is everything is a package. Because one of the complaints of Zen Framework is that uh, it was bloated, it was heavy, and it was slow. So now what they did for Zen Framework 2 is they actually listened to the users and they made every single part of the, of the framework a component that you can install using Pyrus. Pyrus is the pair installer. And that, that's very nice because it makes, if you want to use just Zen Mail, you can just install Zen Mail. You don't have to install the whole Zen Framework which takes like 20 megs of text files. They are redefining how they approach things. Uh, the only con I see to Zen Framework is that if you go to framework.zen.com, you're redirected to some Zen server purchase page. I don't know why, but that's life. <coughs> Another framework that's really worth noting, uh, I know people have very, very diverse opinions of it, and it's Lithium. Do you like Lithium? Me too. <laughs> so Lithium is aspect-oriented programming. I'm not going to get into this. You can come and talk to me after if you want. And what they're doing is really, really embracing PHP 5.3 and trying to, trying to push the boundaries of PHP. It's all about closures. It's all about chains. And if, you have a, if there's a project you want to look out or check, check out, definitely look at Lithium. They, they are a bit opinionated. I mean, one of the guys works with us, uh, one of the founders of Cake and also Lithium. And we always get into fights. But that's fine. That's good. Getting into fights is good. Tensions encourage development and encourage innovation. Positive tensions, obviously. So yeah, if you want to check Lithium, the, the community is much smaller than Symfony and Zen Framework. There's no big corporation behind it, but it's a very cool framework. The way they approach things, it's very interesting. Uh, who's heard of hip-hop? Not the music. 
<laughs> Have you used hip hop any chance? All right, so just to give you an idea, hip hop is something that's been released by, uh, by Facebook. And what it does is it takes your PHP code, compiles it into C++ code, or translates it into C++ code. So it makes pretty much a slug that you can run. Can you imagine what this does? It makes it very fast. There are limitations to using hip hop. Uh, I don't know if they've been resolved, but for instance, you can't use eval. Why would you anyways? But people still do. For instance, uh, WordPress, I think, still does use eval. Might not be using it in a rewrite anyways. And you know, it, it, all those little things, we have tools, we have frameworks, we have crazy corporations that write PHP to C++ translators. But there isn't, isn't something missing? I mean, technology is only one part of a business. Because who makes money here? No one makes money. No one works, no? <laughs> who writes code for a living? <laughs> for food. <laughs> I code for beer. <laughs> Literally. I make money from my code and I buy beer. <laughs> all right, so who's paying for all your stuff? It's the users. I'll get back to this. So the next step, LAMP, LAMP. Everyone knows LAMP, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. It was so amazing 10 years ago. It was so amazing when Apache was the only web server out there. And you know what? I say, fuck Apache. <laughs> it has, I mean, no disrespect to Apache, well, yeah, a little bit. But <laughs> Apache has served a really, really good purpose. Uh, I think it's time for us to move forward. And that's something I call LNNP. LNNP. Uh, I'll let you remember this word. Say it all together in one, two, three. LNP. Wow, it sounds like a church. <laughs> LNNP. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> so what I say by LNNP is, uh, first, that's probably my ugliest slide. It's this one. It's Linux, Nginx, any NoSQL solution. I really hate the term NoSQL, but there's no other way to explain it right now. So MongoDB, CouchDB, React, uh, Redis even, Memcached, all this stuff. And PHP FPM, which is very <coughs> new, as I just showed you in 5.3. Anyone of you used Nginx by any chance? Yeah, yeah. Have you ever looked at the internals of Nginx? How sexy is this shit? <laughs> I'm not joking. The, if, if you ever want to learn how to write C code, you need to, learn, uh, to look at the Nginx internals. In fact, uh, most of the, uh, the Node.js event stuff has been pretty much taken from Nginx. It's, it's sexy, it's fast, and it runs so amazingly. Anyways, I don't even know what I was going to talk about. Yeah! That's it, we're back. We talked about technology, we talked about the language, the tools. Think as an ecosystem, we have the users. What else is there? How do you run your PHP? Where do you run your PHP? Do you still use FTP for deploying? I know everyone's ashamed of saying it, yeah? <laughs> but I know you do because I spoke to a few people that already do. So it brings us to evolution. We started by, uh, well, I'll, I'll relate this to the web, all right? I have something like, I'll say 10, 15 minutes because I started five minutes too late. But uh, I'll bring this to the evolution of the web. Uh, let's say web 1.0 was publishers sending data to users. Web 2.0 was publishers sending data to users and users sending data to publishers as well as to other users. What does that mean for PHP 5.0, uh, PHP 4.3, for web 3.0? I, I really hate the term, but I think what it's going to happen is machines are going to start interacting together. <laughs> Singularity. That's, that's my main goal. And by this, I mean writing APIs, developing stuff uh, that, that, run, that pretty much runs itself. HTTP was designed for this. But uh, as a PHP developer, what do you want to do with this? Do you, do you really want to keep pushing data through FTP to a server? What happens if you have a thousand machines that decide to connect to your machine? or to your server or to your web service. You need to buy more servers and add them. So that's where, that's where platforms or platforms as a service come in. I'm going to do a little sales pitch because that's what I do. It's my company. But uh, I'll try to keep it more kind of psychologically enclosed into just the idea of pass. So are you ready for this one? Check this out. Cloud. <laughs> say, it, say it again with me in church mode. One, <laughs> two, three. Cloud. <laughs> That's pretty good. 
So let's get back to Plato, yeah? Now I understand your background. Well, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's orchestra, and that's our little elephant. <laughs> Anyways, I have a bunch of stories about this later, if you want. And now we have, as I said, we have tools. We have the language with a really, really features, uh, well, rich feature set. But we don't have the machines. We're still, we're still stuck in the past. We're still stuck in the idea that SSH is a good thing. Where it's not, we're developers. As, as all of, well, most of you said, sysadmins are not going to like me here, but you shouldn't need a sysadmin when you're a business. You need to focus on business logic. And deploying apps is something very, very uh, peculiar to some people. Some people use Chef, some people use automated Git checkout, some people use Ant. There's so many solutions out there. But that's what we tried to solve with Orchestra. <laughs> Orchestra is a PHP as a platform, which there's a contest later, which I'll tell you right about. And so if you want to see orchestra.io, that's our platform as a service company. And what we're trying to do is make sec the PHP sexy back again by contributing tools, contributing to PHP, contributing to communities, contributing to conferences, going to other language conferences to show that we, what we have now in PHP and how awesome it is. And obviously, Orchestra runs on LMMP. Otherwise, I wouldn't be advocating it. And what Orchestra does is it allows developers to focus. It allows you to focus on actual building a business. Because as you said, people have to work for a living and they have to make money, and it's the users that give you money. And it's adapted to evolving needs. Whenever a user needs something, it, it's, it's very iterative. The, the process is not closed. It's, it's very open, very community-like, because that's where we're from. We're from the community. And it would kind of defeat the purpose of a product that's been born in the community to not listen to the community. Anyways. As I said, it's modern, that's fine. And there's a really strong concept that I, I, I feel very strongly about. It's not only for orchestra, it's for any application that you're developing. It's called shared nothing architectures. I'm gonna say it again slowly. Shared nothing architecture. What this means is that no part of your system is, independ uh, is dependent on another one. So for instance, the idea behind orchestra is that we do auto scaling. So if your app has a boost of seven million users, we're gonna add all the computing units that you need and it's gonna manage this automatically. That's the premise of the cloud. That's the cloud. That's the premise of auto scaling. The idea is if you're stuck in the, in the past and you're still sh storing your sessions on one machine, then obviously when you auto scale, that doesn't work. That sh storing sessions on a machine, that's not, that's not shared nothing architecture. Storing your database on the same machine, that's not shared nothing architecture because everything is shared by the same machine. Whereas if your, your database is somewhere else and your memcache server is somewhere else, you can scale, something can go down and not your old service goes down, or hopefully not, and your files, same thing for your files, you want to host them in a CDN instead of hosting them in one machine so you can easily distribute stuff. So it's, it's, it's kind of a new concept for most businesses and developers. Uh, I mean, Share Nothing has been there forever, but n not really applied to the average person, it's been applied to very large businesses. But that's the idea of orchestra and most cloud providers is that there's no more managing involved. You don't want to be managing stuff. You don't need SSH. And you know, there's, there's one thing, one, one of the reasons why we built orchestra and why other providers are building this is because we like shiny objects. You know, like you see, as a kid, you, you, you saw a toy and you were like, I need this toy. As an adult now, or ish, there's a new database that comes up. You want to use Redis. You have to configure Redis on your server. You have to do this, you have to do that. It's the same repetitive process that's very annoying. You want to use Mongo, it's the same thing again and again and again. But we all want to use it, but we never have time to. How many times have you told yourself, I'm going to start, and, uh, I'm gonna start learning N technology next week? I've told myself this at least 100 times. And then I was like, oh, fuck, I'm not going to do this again next week. I don't have time to, yada, yada, yada. So there's this guy, uh, a French philosopher, obviously. Ooh, oh. Nice. It's desire and hope will push you to the future. And desire is something very strong because desire, for me, it's laziness that pushes me towards the future. I want to build stuff that's going to make my life easier. And that's exactly the idea uh, behind this whole cloud computing idea. I call it the date theory. Anything that you could use you should at least try it. And that's the only way you're going to learn how other platforms or other services or other technologies or other anything are, are behaving. So for instance, 
on Orchestra, you can just click and it creates a Redis database. Or you can just click and it creates a MongoDB database. So if you want to use MongoDB, you click and it says, ooh, created, just connect to this. Same thing for CouchDB, we're very friends with the Couchbase guys. Uh, and same for React. As you can see, I'm kind of a data freak. That's why those have all been pushed to kind of the top of the priority list. I love, I love performances and I love when data is, because uh, my background is mathematics, yeah? <coughs> Software is only an easy way to make money. And data is such a complex problem to have. And yeah, when, when you want to try and play with technologies, that's what you do. And Cloudflare, who's heard of Cloudflare? Oh, one person. So essentially, Cloudflare is a DNS provider that, prov that gives you extra security, DDoS protection, and all this stuff. And if you go to your dashboard, you can see all the possible threats from the IPs coming in and all this stuff. And it blocks the IPs that are threatful or like possibly could be a threat. That's amazing. So we have databases that you can use easily. You have platforms now. We have the language, and we have the tools. The only, thing, the only problem remaining is us. Really, do you want to start learning Ruby? See, people laugh, but let's reflect for a second, all right? We're PHP developers, and how many times have you told yourself, I can solve this in PHP? How many times have you told yourself, I don't need Python, I don't need Node.js? Surprisingly enough, the learning curve to learning a language is not actually that steep. Someone intelligent enough to be a good developer will pick up a language very easily, especially dynamic languages. I mean, Erlang is probably the toughest language I've had to learn because it, it, it's functional programming and it's very, very different. It took me two weeks and then two weeks in, ding! That's so easy. And then you go back to dynamic languages and you're like, fuck. Anyways, let's reflect, L let's reflect that we all have a God complex. We think we are the master of the universe when it comes to PHP or anything that we can solve with PHP. We are merely the masters of our own realms. You don't need to always use PHP for everything, or you don't need to use Python for everything. There's always a use case. For instance, the, the idea I displayed earlier about using Node.js and PHP, that's a really good idea. Uh, well, not idea, but it's a really cool concept. Because Node.js is very good at real-time data, whereas PHP is very good at everything else. <laughs> God complex. Bing. So there's, there's something I like to say here. Um, well, as I say, it's David's uh, Stockholm Syndrome, because I like to annoy people. I like to annoy people a lot. I'm an engineer, and there's one thing that took me about five years to understand. Yeah, I don't read this shit. <laughs> what this means is, how many times have you bitched about something else, about other, another language or something on Hacker News, and you decided, this sucks, I'm, I'm voting this down, uh, 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 bad, bad, bad. Everyone has, has done this at least once, or at least told someone, this project sucks, why? Don't know, but it sucks. <laughs> I saw someone blog about it. Really? There, there's a very, uh, my, my background in mathematics is game theory, and I'm all into war and strategy and stuff like this. And there's a <coughs> quote I really much like, which is uh, from Sun Tzu, which, uh, which he says, all war is deception. In our case, it's not really a war when we're competing, at, uh, competing against other languages. It's mostly, we seem to want to make it a war, and. The only thing we do is we deceive our users. You will have a, a client coming and say, well, I don't, I don't need your company anymore because we're doing the next thing in Python because I read this. Or we don't need this anymore because we want to use Node.js. But Node.js doesn't apply to this. Oh, it does, it does. I read it on the blog. <laughs> and Sun Tzu was really, really right. And what I'm saying, next time, next time before bitching about something, before going to Hacker News or before really complaining to complain without arguments, think about it, please. Please, please, think about it. Another tip I like to give is think about other technologies. If you have a down at some point, read, read any other language or read or try to contribute to any other communities just to see how, they're, uh, how they behave. I think it's, it's the most amazing thing to, to learn another language and see how other communities uh, interact and evolve because it really opens your mind. You can, you could be stuck on a problem for three weeks and then by going to this new community or this new tech, it could open your mind. Say, like, oh, they have a different approach. And that's why all those really cool PHP frameworks are now raising up so, so good because Ruby on Rails came, uh, Ruby on Rails and Sinatra, and uh, especially Ruby on Rails actually, yeah, sorry, Ruby and Sinatra and Ruby on Rails. 
they really kicked PHP developers in the ass because everyone was like, wow, that's a, that's a really cool framework. It's fast and, well, fast-ish, and it runs. And then the Symfony guys, or Fabian was like, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. So the first version of Symfony was pretty much built to look like Ruby on Rails, but adapted to PHP, because we are PHP developers. So yeah, as I said, polyglottism. I speak seven languages, and I write more languages. I think it's a great thing. It's, it's a great thing to do. And it, it really opens your mind. So if you have a chance, if that's the only thing you have to take away from this, the, the talk that I gave you today, really try to learn another language. Because it's different worlds, but everything is very different. Uh, it's very similar out there. Python developers are not bad developers. Or they're not mean. The only ones that are mean is Ruby on Rails with their scarves. But even then, they have good ideas. If you get past the scarf whiffing, you're fine. So next thing, who, who's a member of a community here? Like Linux user group or any other community, PHP user group, PyCon user group. No one, no one interacts with any communities, no? Or no one understands what I'm saying? <laughs> All right, that worked a little bit. <laughs> so if you can, go and interact with any other community. You need, you need to do this, and the community needs you. There are really good projects here. There's Joined In, which is uh, this event rating and all this stuff. That's all open source. Go online and contribute to it. Even if you report a bug, just talking about something, reporting a bug, that's contributing. It's not only writing code. Just, just mentioning a project online, maybe some of your friends will pick it up, and they will start doing bug fixes, pull requests. You don't even need to actually write code to be a contributor to a project. And that's, that's the beauty about open source. So now there are two things. Every person that goes and rates my talk with a good rating will get a free beer. <laughs> By me, just come see me, we'll get some free drinks. Good, did you see this? <laughs> yeah, all right, the next one. Do you see that bottle of whiskey that's there? And being an Irish company, what we like to do is share a bit of our world and share a bit of our homes with you, you know? So what we did is, for our dear attendees of PHPCon Poland, we brought you a bottle of Middleton Very Rare. Oops. <laughs> eh. Sorry, it's all in wood and stuff. So here's the contest, all right? Anyone that writes a really funny PHP application and deploys it on orchestra by tomorrow, you win this bottle. So if you have any questions, that would be great. Sorry? Questions? Yeah? I don't think there's a, that, I don't think that's ever going to happen. However, uh, there's been a, a large effort in the past few years to move all those extensions to Peko so that you can easily compile without them. So you can disable them at compile time and all this stuff. But no, there's no, there's no fork in, 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 a, in a future vision for removing all this stuff. Sorry. Anyone else? Who's sleeping? Ah, there you go. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Is that it? Well, thank you very much, and a uh, pleasure to be here.